All right. Okay, Mike, I'll hand it over to you. So over to you, Mark. Um, thanks very much. This is a, uh, a sort of a unscheduled um, FBAN network. Um, Miguel and others have been doing some work on cropland fire behaviour, and he has he came, approached me about having a, a, a semi a webinar slash training session around uh, the, the cropland fire reconstruction guide that, that they produced as part of the research. So I said, sure, it seems to be the stuff that FBANs want to do or want to know about, so here we all are. I think you all know Miguel from CSIRO. Uh, I don't really need to say much more. Over to you, Miguel. All right, thanks. Thanks, Mike. And, um, Thanks, Greg, and thanks, yeah, th thanks for the opportunity to organize this, this uh, webinar on such short notice. So um, let me just give you some introduction why we are doing this. Um, essentially, uh, we have this project that I think uh, was pushed by CFA, but then has involved a lot of, more, a lot of other agencies and um, to the Bushfire National Elder CRC. Uh, it's about developing a, a crop fire uh, reconstruction guide. And uh, we were saying that we we're getting a bit late in the season. Initially, we had, we had planned to do a face-to-face -face training. But then we realized if you do that, we're not going to get that much people uh, into this, so let's do a, a webinar. That's something that can archived, and then we go from there. So uh, the reason, uh, besides that, uh, well, I think I guess the initial question um, that people have been um, asking is uh, how good are the current grass fire spread models of predicting the propagation of crop fires, right? As uh, I guess. Uh, a lot of bands there that probably know more than me um, or than us, uh, but that that question has been floating around a bit. Um, and then came this idea: okay, let's get some uh, uh, data from wildfires um, and uh, evaluate the models against the uh, crop fires. Uh, so that's where came this idea of: well, let's develop a guide so people. F bands and also other other first responders can uh, document the fire, develop a case study, and then with that data that we amaze through a season or, or so two seasons, we then can start evaluating the models um, we, we we are using for grass fires. Um, yeah, so as I, as I said, this was, as I was thought this course has thought a day long. Uh, but then, yeah, we want to reach as much people. We also realize the season in some of these crop areas is starting to is starting right now, so we better get this out as soon as possible. And so it was really short notice that we can we get together and put this course. The idea also is to follow up this webinar with if there's some good uh, crop fires, we will make uh, organize a, a, a field trip. Uh, maybe in Victoria, maybe in South Australia, maybe in New South Wales, somewhere it's, it's um, not too far for people to travel, where you could all get together and d discuss some of these methods. Uh, the other idea we have is maybe after the season, do a bit of a workshop and bring together all those case studies that people did and, and work them a bit more and take them to where we want in terms of isolating the data, get the best the best data, higher quality data, and go from there to evaluate the models. Okay, some uh, just uh, in terms of some interaction co uh, options here. Because this is not face to face, but we would like to have a, a, quite a, a dialogue. So feel free, just put some questions here. We are watching the the question box. So if you put something there, we'll um, try to answer as we go, not to break the flow, but not let some questions and doubts hanging. Uh, and then if you 
follow up after just uh, some emails there that you can um, use uh, fire some questions some case studies some things any questions yeah just go ahead so course outline this kind of how we divided the course 10 sessions and the other people responsible to deliver and kind of tentative duration not sure how much this is going to take but uh, just to give you some idea initially start some um, the concept of case studies we, we talk about this case study concept in the F band courses you go a little bit here too on that pre-fire preparation some important aspects to bear in mind we could do that in the end uh, as we do all the all the bits here but then so okay maybe put it in the beginning because it's so important is people it's important that see people see it while they are fresh as well then talk about things that you can collect during the fire weather fuels things that will go after the fire some aspects on data layers and GIS considerations some interviewing and all we bring all together in the end and and do a report all right no questions yet the case study concept uh, all right people have been doing case studies for a long long time right uh, I think there's something the 1920s people start looking at, into this um, going to fires and, and and get as much information you can from a fire and learn from it right uh, we don't even know I haven't heard before about this term crop fire right? uh, but wildfire case study is, is well ingrained in the um, in, in our uh, fire research and fire management really a, a way to look in a systematic way to look at the event collecting data analyzing information and reporting these results again within in Australia we have a fair bit of uh, case studies done in the past and published some of the early work from Alan MacArthur really goes through this process the things that are available for us to to look uh, why do this, why to do this uh, right there's many many reasons uh, you know, if you have a wildfire going on uh, get information that can be used to brief the current fire status a lot of times we are not aware some of the people are not aware what's really happening in the field if you have somebody in the field collecting the data can feedback that information into the some of that um, decision support uh, room uh, acquired data tells will be used to develop models um, a lot of the models that been that you use in Australia have been uh, developed based on wildfire data named the Syro and fire spread meter uh, test new models and so you see models and, and check their predictive capability acquire locally specific fire behavior uh, fuel types that only occur in certain specific areas there's not going to be any uh, meaningful research done in those fuel types sometimes the case study is the best way to get some of that 5 EV data use in training litigation and possibly other reasons um, again to talk about use of models uh, models are uh, very simplified the only description of the system they only go so far so as Neil Barrow said, what's this, 30 years ago or more, more than 30 years ago, and still quite valid. Uh, expectations of how fire should behave are largely based on experience um, and less extent on the 5 EV guides on fire models. Really, is that experience, you know, when you talk about uh, high-end fire behavior, that's where it kicks in, and that comes from being able to document case studies and extracted data that really matters just some examples of um, develop an evaluation so we have a uh, graph fire as I mentioned based on 22 graph fire observations that were collected over a period of 
you know, 15, 20 years. Um, the fourth fire danger meter, MacArthur Mark V, also based on wildfires, we don't know how many. We're using development of, of that model, but a fair bit. A shrubland model that uh, Wendy Anderson developed was validated against wildfire, and also the Vesta model, being a lot of wildfire data being used to validate it, uh, named the work that Musa Killings did in Victoria, amazing, a lot of wildfire data um, to do the to evaluation both McCarter and Vesta models, and also some of that information led us to understand the limits of the models, under which condition fuel moisture conditions or wind, are the models not working, things like that. So quite valuable information. Another aspect why we need this kind of data, um, there's a lot of things we call, we cannot collate in experiments, right? Really only comes from the wildfire data, the aspect, aspects such as spotting, uh, mass, mass spotting, under which conditions are these things happening, which forest types are associated with this kind of fire behavior, only get from um, wildfire case studies. Again, distance of spotting and density, things like that. And, it seems that, and we have started seeing some, some studies being published right now where people are looking to these case studies uh, and quantify this kind of information on spotting dynamics that up to now we didn't have, have it. Right, so um, one more justification. And uh, another one aspect is really the future is promising for this kind of work. And the reason being is that right now we have way more in data sources that we didn't have in the past, and we have more accurate data. We're talking about weather station. We have um, a, a more, more dense network of uh, automated weather stations. We have the possibility to uh, put uh, out, um, automatic also portable weather stations in the field. We have also post-fire uh, post um, weather modeling to fine-tune that those weather fields that driving fire propagation. We have information on, on, on fuels, fuel maps, state level fuel maps that are way more uh, detailed and accurate than what we had in the past. We have here also the availability of citizen, sci citizen science data. People are collecting photos, movies, have their own weather station in their backyard, and that might not be so good in terms of the requirements of the, the the bureau in terms of weather, but sometimes to capture information on particular wind changes, things like that, um, is very, very uh, useful. And availability of line scans, aerial, other aerial imagery that in the past we didn't have much, but more and more we have that kind of information um, available to do the, the, the case studies. And again, also social media. People are putting so much information online that you can just go there and, and kind of uh, look into that and find a lot of detail that um, before we didn't have, right? So, um, so the stage is ripe to some really good work in terms of case studies documentation. Um, I have a little question here, a little comment, Greg Mattingly, yes. Yeah last year. Yeah, very good point. For the um, audience. Just before we go into the details of um, go out and collect data uh, for these case studies, some, some pointers on pre-fire Preparation, um, and we divide this into three different aspects, and this is really about how we're going to maximize the opportunity to collect crop fire data. And one is project awareness, and I guess a lot of these things can be applied for wildfire data, not just crop fires. 
project awareness is about having a good network uh, of people that are aware of the project, Fish situational awareness of the fire season, and when you should really be ready to get out and start collecting some of the data, and the field equipment. In terms of project awareness, it is really about having the regional and local resources aware of the project and willing to support acquisition of relevant fire data. Yes. Yes. Uh, just so, uh, so much people and um, F-bands or ground observers, yes. there's just a certain amount of data they can get, they can get, uh, get in the field. And a lot of other people on the fire line that um, can also collect data and can make things happen for you, right? In terms of like I talk about regional and local resources getting line scans happening if they know you are working on the fire. So that's all about awareness of the project, of the need of having that data being collected during a fire. Second point, alert IMT of the project. Again, they will be knowing a lot of collecting a lot of information on the fire. And if they are aware of the project of what you're conducting within a, in a fire, they can make sure some of more of the data is collected and, and archived um, for, for later uh, use. And again, ensure key air resources, air resources really have a, a a unique view of the fires uh, and being, being aware of what's going to happen, they put, can put some more work and have more time devoted to some of these, um, collecting some of the information from the air. That, uh, yeah. uh, one, one, one picture from the air, it, 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 it covered a lot of ground in terms of what's happening in the fire that no one in, on the ground can, can acquire. Again, going from the regional for the local, uh, and also situation awareness. Uh, being aware of, of the fire area, uh, or like or your local area, and how the fire season is progressing. When should you really be kick, kicking out and be ready to get out to collect some of the, the data we'll talk uh, ahead, some of that um, Fire data that occurs during the during the okay you can collect directly during the fire, right? Uh, where the source is possible, where the source is on your area, fire towers that are also going to collect can collect some of the data. So all these people that are uh, aware and the local local brigades, right? Uh, those will be the people that will be in the fire. A lot of times we go and interview these people after the fire. But if they will be aware of this project before, they will be collecting a lot more information, photos, videos, you know, sketching maps. So if these people are aware of the project, they will be working with you, collect a lot of data in maximizing the opportunity for this case study. And equipment, this is really, I sent, I sent this morning um, that draft uh, guide and, uh, and the field sheets. And in the field sheets, we have these checklists, uh, namely for equipment check checklists to get that you should carry when conducting this kind of work. This is just a, a subsample, maybe the most important. Uh, AWS availability, fuel sampling kit, fuel moisture sampling kit, uh, handheld weather station, things like that, video, photo cameras, GPS, field sheets, uh, local maps, a lot of that stuff. Again, this is just to raise awareness of what's in the, in the field sheets, equipment necessary really to maximize your uh, data you collect. All right, um, going to this uh, section three, fire propagation and behavior during the fire. 
So we divide this uh, in terms of fire behavior data collecting in the, during the fire and after the fire. Uh, some of these also discussing this with CFA, talking about who would be using this guide, F-bands, maybe F-bands sometimes, but a lot of um, fire observers will be collecting this kind of information, and some of this information is more for them. But um, first slide here, importance of data collected during the event. A lot of times we collect, uh, we do these case studies um, with data is collecting after the fire, months after the fire. So a lot of information is being lost. You note that um, wildfire is a hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic um, event. Fire behavior changes very rapidly or very slowly over different time periods. Uh, we need to capture this dynamic. Sometimes when, when we average things over one, two, three hours, we are lo losing a lot of that detail. Uh, that's really important. And so that's where this need to collect the data in the fire is so important, right? Um, the larger the amount of information that we, if we are able to collect during the fire, the more accurate, the, m the less uncertain the, f the fire case study is going to be. And um, there will be definitely during the wildfire, during the crop fire, a number of opportunities to collect direction information on the fuels before they burn, on the weather, and very local weather, and on fire behavior. As I said, some of this information is time critical, and if you don't collect it in the fire, you're not going to be able to know it. So that's why we put some quite an emphasis in this during the fire um, data collection. And again, the information can be collected by you or by others. So it's, it's about having this network, not just not just you, but this network of uh, people that can work with can work with you to maximize this data collection. Uh, what's more? What's most important? Uh, that's also my my view a bit of my view or some of our views here um, in terms of case studies and fire behavior. Uh, we can complicate things, but we can also have things very simple. The concern we have with fires from a fire management point of view is that fires are crop fires, wildfires are free spreading fires on the landscape. And we know we, they have flame heights and they have a lot of other things associated with it. But the most important thing is how fast the fire is going to spread on landscape, right? That's inf information we use to warn people when is fire going to be in point A, B, or C. So with that uh, frame of mind, uh, the most important things to record is really the position of that fire with time, right, during major runs. That's, that's the most important thing. That's where you should put, put the most focus. And a lot of things flow from that kind of information. You can calculate rates of fire spread and later intensity from that information, knowing where the head fire is during major, major fire runs. Perimeters are also, the side of the fire flanks, also important, but head fire is the key. Want to know the fuels sustaining fire propagation? Right? Uh, want to know, hopefully, before they burn, if we can. Uh, if not, we need to reconstruct the fuels uh, through indirect, indirect um, methods. But from fuels, we're going to be able to calculate intensity, energy release, things related to the plume development, things like that. Um, environmental conditions. Namely, represent wind speeds that match fire spread intervals. That's also important to be able to capture that somehow close to the fire area, not influenced by the fire, right? Also has to do uh, with the established network of uh, automatic weather stations. Yeah, is, are there weather stations close to the fire? Are they not? How much uh, is important that you collect weather 
uh, in wind um, data during the fire event. Other relevant, relevant fire features, uh, spotting, very, very important, important, and also crown fire activity. Also, uh, talking about not just crown fire, but uh, fire BV features that lead to like non uh, Non-linear changes in fire behavior. So things like fire behavior changing linearly with wind, but all of a sudden something happens that rate of spread doubles or triples, uh, right? And that's sometimes because of crowning, it's because of spotting. So these non-linear features. So it's, it's good to be able to identify and quantify these things. And the other aspect effects of suppression. Uh, and two aspects is one, in constraining the spread of the fire, if you are solely interested in fire behavior, you want to know when suppression is going to affect that uh, rates of spread and flank propagation. Um, but if you are interested on suppression by an suppression aspect on the effectiveness of suppression, right? That's another aspect that uh, you want to know about that. And Matt will come in quite de fair detail on that later on. So talk about um, rates of spread. Spotting some quite quick notes on, spot, on spotting. Uh, it's about location and timing on spot fires. Spot fires sometimes don't, don't happen all the time, are going to be localized, are going to be um, associated with certain uh, vegetation types that are going to be burned. If you're talking about here about crop fires, there will be, within a crop fire, there might be some native vegetation here and there that are going to lead to some more spot fires. There might be some crops that, because of their structure, lead to more spot fires. Um, so things to look into. Uh, you want to have estimates of the possible firebrand sources, uh, when they happen, distance to main, the main fire front, uh, and their density. And that's another is important aspect. Some, a lot of times we have spotting, but spotting is going to be overrun by the main front, right? So the importance of spotting here is going to be really into enabling the fire to overcome obstructions like roads or fire bricks and things like that. And so that's something important to note. Um, in a recent, um, recent, as an example, a recent case study, you're working with Musa and others in um, Western Victoria. Really a lot of spot fire information came from looking to the um, timing of and location of, of drops from helicopters. So you start noticing there was a lot of helicopters that were working outside of the main fire area at a particular time. And what they were doing was putting spot fires out. Uh, so there's some kind of information. Might, you might not be able to see them in your location, but you derive these spot fire locations from some indirect information. Flame front characteristics, that's also we like to have some information. It's a bit more um, secondary, let's say, but also of some use. Uh, namely, we use a lot of that for uh, difficulty um, to suppression in some of that planning environment. And I say it's a bit secondary because it's very difficult to accurately measure these kind of things in the field and during a, a, a wildfire. And it's very, very easy also to be led into error and be um, overcome by, by flashes of, of tall flames. And you normally like to think about average flame heights and flame dimensions, some of just occasionally um, glimpse of very tall flames. Uh, but anyway, this is some of the, and you go into detail in, some, in, in that guide, uh, how to visually and from footage look estimating flame heights, lengths, and depths of flames. Um, 
something to bear in mind if you can. But again, and we'll go uh, into a bit later into some of that. Uh, uh, be pragmatic, and there's a lot of things happening during wildfire, and where where to focus, and don't keep, don't be distracted by some of the side side um, fireworks, let's say. Um, going back to this phrase of requisites to follow the fire. Uh, very quickly, we went through a few things we want to capture. Uh, it's a lot of you go, you follow fire, capture as much as you can, and you learn uh, as you go. Um, some of these practices requisites it's really a close connection with key personnel involved in the fire, um, namely the IMT, and, and make sure that you are going to focus on important sections of the fire. Right? This goes back to here below the situation awareness, uh, what's happening in the broader fire picture, where is fire going, where is fire suppression happening um, that might take you away, that uh, you might not, might not be very interested in areas where you know fire suppression is happening is very effective because that, from a point of view of collecting rates of spread, that's not going to be very useful. So again, it goes back to this um, being aware of what the fire is doing, get a close connection to the key personnel to have that information and go to areas where you know that the fire is going to spread being impeded by suppression. Again, make sure firefighters are aware of the study. They will be able to collect a lot of the data, they have the right equipment on the list, and also here use your F-band cap capacity to be ahead of the fire. Uh, know what the fire is going to do so that you can pre-position yourself in certain areas, know the landscape, and be able to get some of this information. We will kind of validate maybe what the, what the, the predictions are make, but also be able to arrive there before the fire. So no, do, not follow, do not follow the fire, be ahead of the fire. And obviously, the main, main concern is safety, right? And uh, um, you probably know more about that than I do, so um, not much, uh, I would not delve much into that, um, given the time we have. Uh, some of this uh, direct fire propagation observation that you can't collect in the fire, uh, first column there is the, the stuff you can collect, the site of reconstructor, um, you know, know about the fire, where, where the fire is, what our flame fights, the flame heights are, different time steps, what fuels are being burned, and there's a purpose there. We talked about, uh, you know, it's about reconstructing the, the fire propagation, the flame front location, then go be, go able to start drawing some uh, ISO crowns. Other information that can be collected during the fire, infrared line scans, and that's uh, something you you need to request somebody to to do, go back to that good connections project, project awareness. And oblique aerial photos, things that can be taken by the aerotech supervisor. Matt will go into detail and into some of that as well. Um, again, things that will capture the fire in a moment in time and really give clear views of what the fire is doing and firefighter observations. Uh, not just what people can collect um, in terms of video and, and, and still photos, but also uh, some of that um, interview. We will later go into the interview process but some of that information that people can also uh, start thinking about if they're aware of the fire to later be or debrief you. Um, there's a lot of other information they will not be able to collect you in the fire. Uh, but 
you just need to be aware that that information is going to be collected by other people. So just about you being efficient and not spending too much time to certain things, knowing that that kind of information be, can be collected elsewhere and then you will put everything together later. So uh, talk about um, fire information with the IMT unit, uh, vegetation and fuel, things that exist in the databases, or we talk about crop, crop fires, some things that the, the farmers uh, will know. Infrastru infrastructure, in terms of uh, roads uh, and width of these roads, things like that. Um, terrain as well, uh, GIS, Google Earth, uh, grassland curing, vegetation greenness, things like that also available from elsewhere. So maybe you don't worry about that during the fire. Public observations, that's something uh, um, if you talk with people, members of the public, during the fire event, you can start you know, uh, giving away your card for later contact. Uh, police investigation, things like that. Suppression resource tracking, that's something just mentioned before, knowing where the fire tracks, where the helicopters are. Um, so that's stuff that will come handy, but you don't need to worry much about that. Skip that one. Uh, send take home messages from this uh, first section. It's going to be a fast moving fire. Uh, normally grassland fire is fast, uh, wildfire is fast. Crop fires tend to be, because of the environment they are occurring, tend to be also not just fast, but they are going to end, end quick, right? And uh, besides some, some outliers that can go for many, many kilometers, some of those fires don't go as long because the landscape is so fractioned. They will not go as long as other fires. So um, you, you really need to be fast, efficient, and opportunistic about what you capture. Um, you're not going to be able to record everything, but just focus as a priority on what's most important. Um, namely location flame front with time, and from that you get rates of spread and intensity and things like that. It's better to collect more flame front locations with time than more weather data or more fuel data, right? And I guess depends on the fuel, the location, how, how those things vary within the landscape. Uh, I guess there's no rules of, there's no guidebook or rule of thumb, you really need to have a, your feel of what's happening. Um, even a few flame front locations of a burn period will result in available data. It does need to be a, a very comprehensive um, data set with many fire locations with time. One or two might be enough for a case study to have really good uh, reliable data to evaluate the, evaluate the models. And just a, a shout out for spotting. Yeah, it's a really key research need to understand in some of these fires, and we don't have much, so the more you can capture on that, the better. And now I pass to the next talk, Andrew Sullivan, going to continue on this topic. Thanks, Miguel. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about weather, and you probably already know an awful lot about weather and what you need for doing FBAN type tasks, and there's not a lot of difference um, between that and this. So just a quick overview, we're going to talk about some of the key variables that we need to collect. We're going to talk about um, direct observations of weather, uh, manual measurements and automated measurements, uh, other data sources that will be of use in doing the reconstruction. We're going to touch on assessment of data reliability, which is going to become a key factor across all of our, um, our talks today. Um, very brief mention of averaging of weather data. 
and summarising into some take home messages. So a key were the variables. Of course, they're dependent upon the, the fire behaviour knowledge that we have. So um, the level of understanding of the factors that determine the behaviour of a fire are going to tell you what sorts of things that we need to uh, collect. And for cropland fires, these are very similar to grassland fires. So a lot of the factors are actually uh, the same. So in order of importance, there's wind speed and wind direction we need to collect, air temperature and relative humidity for determining the moisture content of the fuel. And then we move to sort of secondary um, weather uh, variables. These are cloud cover and solar radiation. Uh, an understanding of the vertical wind profile above the fire and atmospheric stability, which is uh, closely related. So automated observations, as you know, the bulk of the weather data um, is likely to come from the Bureau of Meteorology's network of automatic weather stations, but they're not um, everywhere and quite often they don't happen to be in the same place fires are. So there's a, always a, a need for trying to augment the automatic weather station network. And a lot of the agencies have invested in portable automatic weather station pools. Um, so it's quite critical um, where it's possible and feasible to actually set up a pause that's close to the fire area in a safe location that's not likely to get burnt to allow uh, more precise data to be collected on the conditions that are driving the fire. Now the setup of the pools should follow the World Meteorological Organization standards, um, particularly in regards to siting and the effect of obstructions that may influence or um, affect the measurements that are done by the pools. Um, and as I said in the previous slide, wind speed and wind direction are the most important and the Citing requirements for ensuring that the wind speed and direction is not influenced by um, obstructions is, is um, uh, quite important and in some places not possible to actually achieve. It's something like the, the anemometer needs to be located 10 times the height of the nearest, uh, 10 times the height of the nearest um, obstruction away from the obstruction. Um, and we also need to have a good understanding of the periods of which the observations are going to be averaged. Now, we can complement the automatic weather station data with direct observations. And if you're in the field and observing the fire, you can actually conduct um, relatively frequent observations of the weather um, using handheld instrumentation if you've got it or uh, other instrumentation that can be set up um, by the side of the road um, within a, a close distance from the from the fire but not affected by the fire. So handheld instruments like kestrels or, or similar can be used to, to collect a lot of this information in terms of wind speed and wind direction. But we still need to ensure that the measurements are meeting as far as we can achieve the um, WMO standards for sighting and measurement. We need to be able to measure the wind for at least 10 minutes. So just sticking a, a kestrel up into, into a gust that's blowing as you, as you uh, become aware of it for a minute or two, or even less, um, isn't going to cut it. So it needs to be set on a, a, on a tripod and measured for, for um, at least 10 minutes and temperature and relative humidity should be measured in the shade. You can also use uh, things like the Beaufort wind scale, um, observations of cloud cover, even, even taking notes of, of wind gustiness and changes in the wind direction um, can be very useful when trying to reconstruct the behaviour of the fire. Now there are also lots of other sources of data if there's no AWS in the region around the fire, there possibly could be other sources of automatic weather um, being recorded. Um, farms, uh, agribusinesses, even wind farms may have automated weather collection um, facilities. 
So you need to find out um, what is available and check their reliability. Not everybody's going to have a, a weather station set up to meet WMO standards, so you need to ensure that you, you check it out to make sure that uh, the, the data is actually quite useful. There are also simulated data sets, as Miguel mentioned early on. Um, the the reanalysis uh, gridded post hoc forecast that the bomb um, can do, quite useful. Also, surface wind simulations, for example, the sort of stuff that comes out of Wind Ninja could also be quite uh, quite useful when doing a reconstruction. Other uh, outputs from the Bureau can be very useful. So synoptic mean sea level pressure charts, um, aerological diagrams, or, or the F-160 SKU-T diagrams, um, showing the upper atmosphere um, lapse rates can be very useful. Uh, and I understand some of the agencies are, are running their own balloon flights for collecting that sort of data. So all that can be very, very useful. You need to be aware of what's available and um, arrange to obtain it um, when possible. So data reliability is going to be one of the key bits in your task as a fire reconstructor, and that's quantifying, um, albeit subjectively, how good the data is that you've collected. Um, and in terms of weather, some of the factors that are going to determine the reliability is the distance of the measurement site from the fire. How applicable is the, is the weather that's been measured to the fire? Um, the, the siting suitability and exposure to the instrumentation is also very important. Um, influence of nearby vegetation structures can mean that the even though the, the weather station is close to where the fire is, it's stuck behind a, a tree or a large bush and is not measuring um, the wind that is actually affecting the, the broader area where the fire is. Um, and topographic interference could also play a big part. The other thing to, to be aware of is, is what the logging period is for the, for the station. Um, we would really like things that are measuring every second or minute. Um, quite often they're, they're more than a minute, um, sometimes they're an hour. Sometimes they're once a day, and in some places, <laughs> once in a blue moon. Um, you need to be aware of what's actually being recorded. Now, the reliability rating uh, goes from one, which is highly reliable, through to a rating of five, which is barely reliable. Um, and we give a range of values here. So in this table, we sort of describe uh, what the subjective rating that we apply to uh, the weather data source. So if you've got an AWS that's within, say, 20 kilometres of the fire, um, or actually taking direct measurements in the field with high quality instruments, um, then we'd give that a, a rating of 1. If your AWS is within 50 k's but further than 25 k's, um, then it might get a rating of 2, and if it's within 50 k's but being affected by you know local um, structures or whatever you might give it a three and goes right down to a reliability rating of five where the only weather um, data you've got uh, exists in an observation that's made a long way away from where the fire is um, or may not actually be using reliable instrumentation or may be affected by um, uh, structures. So averaging, when you come to combining the information, the weather information with the information you have on the fire, you need to have some way of, of um, relating them. And we do that through averaging. So an averaging does depend on how often the data is collected, but the, the period of the of averaging the weather should be commensurate with the period of observation of the fire spread. So if you've got um, an observation of fire spread that, that goes for 20 minutes, then you need to, to average the weather if you can over that, uh, that similar period of 20 minutes. Um, if you're getting um, high frequency weather data from your instrumentation, say, you know, once a second or faster or, or you know, once a minute, um, you need to average that, but you shouldn't be averaging less that, that over a period of less than 10 to 20 minutes. 
And that's because um, short-term effects of gusts and lulls may unduly influence that average um, if you average it over a less period. And what we know is that the fire isn't necessarily going to respond over the broader area to that, that um, fine scale gust and lull structure in the wind. So rate of spread is, is more correlated with whether over longer term average values. Um, and you might not ever be able to correlate short term short distance fire behaviour with anything that you measure because of the, the chaotic nature of the, the way the, the, um, the flame zone um, uh, propagates through fuels. The other thing is if you average over longer periods, you, you allow for um, a, a greater distance between the measurement point and the fire itself. So just summarising that into some take home messages. The bomb has a very good AWS, AWS network, um, although they don't have AWS is in exactly the right spot when you need it. Um, they've distributed quite well. Um, you can download directly from the BOM website data from any web, uh, any AWS um, for the last 72 hours. Um, so you can grab that on the, on, the, on the fly. If you need something beyond that, then, then data can be purchased for specific AWSs from the BOM. Um, Direct measures in the field or using pools uh, are a great way to augment any of the information that the Bureau may have, um, but we need to ensure that high quality data, uh, high quality instrumentation is being used in a suitable location um, and it's not being influenced by the presence of fire. Um, if there are no AWSs or, or pools available, then you need to see if there are other alternative sources of, of data available such as wind farms or, or farmers who run their own little weather station. Um, and of course there are other sources of non-standard weather data from the bomb such as aerological diagrams and um, pressure charts. And the last slide for this section. Um, we need to determine the reliability for all the data that you use. For any source that you have, you need to give it a scale of one to five, one for best, five for worst. Once you get the data, you need to then be able to collate it in the most easiest form. Now that, in most instances, will probably be an Excel spreadsheet, but if you're handy, you could probably use a statistics package such as R to, to pull it all together and, and conduct some of the analysis. We need to obtain um, longer term averages, particularly with the wind speed, over periods that align with observations of the fire spread. Um, but don't be tempted to try to average wind speeds over shorter, uh, less than 20 minute periods because the, the gust and lull structure will distort the value that you get and might not be um, indicative of, of the behaviour of the fire. And that is it for weather. I'll hand it back to Miguel. All right. Okay. Uh, um, let, let me just notice that uh, when we plan this webinar, we're not very concerned that to make it very small because you know there's a lot of content. Um, so we've been talking about for about 15 minutes now. We are a bit more than halfway um, because the value really is people can watch also later at their own timing. So we prefer to put more content and make it slightly longer than an hour instead of making it short and not to all the content we want it. Um, assessment of fuel distribution and fuel moisture. Um, so in here I com combine the data that uh, we, you can collect during the fire event and also after the fire. And I guess one thing it might clear that when somebody is going to work on this um, reconstruction of fire behavior, collecting data from the field, he's not really just a one person job, it's more like a team, right? Um, and uh, so different people can also do different things. Right, not just important, not just for safety, but also that so that you can get 
a lot of this data collected simultaneously. Um, so we only talk about fuels. What we really want to do is to understand the fuels that burn in the fire, and want to have a map of that those fuels. That's uh, as simple as that. So if you can get that, then you can start cross the fire behavior with the weather and with the fuels and understanding what's happening in terms of spread patterns, suppression difficulty, um, and things like that. Uh, within crop areas, as it's a really nice photo, really illustrates, you normally you're going to be um, you're going to see a, a mosaic of of different crops just because for safety uh, farmers tend to you want to diversify their cropping right so uh, if there's disease if, there, if there's um, diseases or or, or or market crash in the market of certain uncertainty in the market in certain crops they always have a better a good average of what they bring home right so um, and so we have this mosaic of crops that are going to be burned, and you want to know what what is in each paddock, and you also want to describe these crops as a fuel. Uh, and I guess we are still a bit in the in the start of this this process because there's not much information in, t uh, in terms of having these crops as a fuel. How uh, how tall is uh, the fuel bed, how much fuel in the, in the fuel bed, right? Um, that also varies with where you are in the location, with site productivity, uh, with rainfall of the area, and things like that. So we need to, to kind of start quantify that. Um, and because we don't have much of that data now, we need to, as, as we do the case study, one concern is to get that kind of information. Um, in terms of fuel distribution, um, yeah, we need to map the crops and also other fuels, right? This can be done early imagery. A lot of that kind of information can be um, derived during the during the fire from aero text provider photos if they are taken. Uh, can be also obtained later uh, by flying a, a, a drone, um, things like that. And you can also collect some of that information uh, by direct observation ahead of the fire before the, the, the crops burn from video and photographs. Uh, normally those, those photographs and videos, if you're taking a, a common phone, they'll have a GPS um, reference that would allow to go back later and uh, know where the photo was turned, what was taken, and uh, again, any of these Direct observations require a quite good situation awareness, so we don't get into arms way. And another thing uh, I mentioned here is one important thing to do is to uh, note the key fuel features, and you go into that later, and sketch the distribution ahead of the fire. Uh, this is a good example. We have a, f a photo of a, a fire that just just occurred, but uh, as simple as you get these photos and start kind of sketching different areas of fuels, then that later you can go back to to the farmer and kind of ask him the questions: what was in what uh, what paddock? You can also use a portable GIS environment and just do and draw directly into into the that environment if you want. Uh, we're talking here uh, this morning about how nice it would be to have a way to identify different um, crop types just from aerial imaginary. Uh, I don't know, sure, uh, if it's possible. Like in this one, you can see you can see if it's harvest crop clearly from an harvest, like that more yellow 
looks like it's unharvested. In the harvest, normally you see the the um, you see more of the the dirt and um, how the, the crop was was uh, where the crop was laid. Um, but again, I'm not sure if there's also scope to get some of that. Some people might know uh, that you can get some of that information from aerial photos. Uh, crop type and conditions, things you are interested. You want to know what kind of crop? Is it a cereal? Uh, is it wheat, or barley, others? Is it a pulse? Is it canola? Um, these things burn very, very differently. And uh, so that's where it just, it's not just a crop. What type of crop is quite important to know? Uh, also, is it a grassland? Is that a paddock that has been laid to rest or is laid to rest normally? Uh, for wildlife within a, um, within a, a farm that's never uh, subjected to cropping. So really we need to know what crop species uh, it is in each paddock, condition pre and post harvested, if it was harvested, been baled or not. Also another interesting aspect, where you are, uh, the cropping, the, 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 the seeding density is going to be different. And so also the, the fuel load is going to be different. So these things are going to be depending on the location you are. Dry areas tend to have support much less uh, um, plants for, different, for a given crop. Crop greenness, uh, again, curing level. Sometimes some fires might be occurring in, in crops that are not fully cured. Um, again, it's important to know that. Um, and here into more detail, as we don't have much information right now on the, the fuel structure in the crops, it's important to, if you do a case study, to go and uh, measure the height of the crop, uh, namely in stubble or stubble, and spacing between plants, or note continuity, continuity if that's relevant. Again, goes back to some more arid areas have much less plants, continuity might be um, an issue. And also other fuel types um, that are, are burned by the fire, and they will need to be mapped following the state convention. Whatever, whatever fuel classification is used in the states, that's what should be used, or the bushfire fuel classification. Um, and also take photos and conduct overall fuel as an assessment is possible for fuel types that are not uh, the crops. In the guide, in that uh, guide for constructing cropland wildfires, we start making a bit of a photo guide for different crops. Uh, we still try to chase a lot of photos and better photos. But we have a bit of a description of uh, the, the crops on the green, on the cured state, and the harvest state for different crops from wheat, barley, canola, um, oats, green peas, chickpeas, a lot of different things. But uh, still a bit incomplete because we, we depend on, 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 those on those photos to be sent to us. Um, for us to develop that guide. And also another idea is to then complement that with some quantifiable uh, metrics of fuel structure, namely heights and fuel loads, uh, so that people don't will not need to sample so much the, the fuels, but can have that information already available to them. In the case you don't have uh, the information, as uh, right now, what we say is to and this also goes back to how relevant this wildfire is, crop fire is. And if you have the time, go and do some uh, fuel sampling um, of the relevant fuels that were burned by that, by that fire. Um, again, this just image shows the same fire as before. And as simple as go on the side and put some transects and with some to some quadrants and the method to sample these fuels is described on the guide. So you, can, you go and put some, some, some quadrants, collect the fuels, measure heights, 
in the space, and then you can have the biomass also of the of the relevant crops you are working on. So right now, that's really quite important information because we don't have that information right now mm -hmm. for any of the crops, really. Uh, in terms of fuel assessments, there's some really important um, timing issues. Uh, so really, this work needs to be done quite quick. Um, and you have here, uh, in terms of fuel assessment and the timing, different different activities and things that need to be done within a certain time scale, namely contact the farmer within a few days after the fire, establish the main crops and crop history also within a week, so things are not going to change. Um, namely, if you're going to go and do some of that uh, fuel, fuel sampling. Um, Again, identify other relevant fuel types and barriers to propagation within all oh, within a week. Really, want to do that field field work really after. And if you want to go do the crop sampling, also within a week. And also, there's an issue here with fuel moisture. If there's live crops where fuel moisture is an issue, uh, need to be really within within days. Get back to that in a, sen a second. And if you just get fuels, you know, you want to do it within a few weeks. Don't let time go by because time will go by, you get busy with other things, and that might be the case. You'll never get opportunity to, to do this work. Uh, in terms of fuel, other aspect of fuels is fuel moisture, right? Fuel structure, one aspect, you put all that this together, fuel moisture. Uh, there can be really some good, um, sharp changes in fuel moisture throughout the day uh, as the diurnal cycle of fire severity uh, unfolds. So uh, it's important to have different, you want to capture this, this dynamic. It's not just one fuel moisture throughout the day, um, it's about several. Uh, there's diurnal variation that's dependent on the temperature and RH, uh, but there's also the spatial variation as is shown in this in this map here in the, on, the, on the bottom, and that's things that you can, you, you want to capture. Um, with this, fuel moisture can be directly measured, can collect samples and over dry them, but again, it's a quite time consuming uh, feature, and a lot of times impractical, namely when you talk about a uh, special scale of the fire, a uh, large fire, and also over the day, right? If you think about doing hourly samples over the day, start getting a, quite a workload uh, just for one person. So a lot of times this is not going to be available, but some, some people might be inclined to do this kind of work. So it's important if they can do, because what they can do from this data is to calibrate models, right? And the other thing we can do is do this kind of work on a non-fire day to calibrate the models. So we have that information. And if you need to use the models for, for grass fuel moisture, uh, you know, depending on your crop, if you need to adjust the model or not. Uh, so what I really could recommend is for your case study, if you didn't sample anything, you conduct model estimates for that fuel moisture from knowledge of air temperature or relative humidity. Uh, the function we use, we know them to be quite accurate. And given that hot and um, dry and windy environment that um, characterizes wildfires, we know it's all about relative humidity and air temperature in terms of fuel moisture. So models work pretty well in those conditions. Um, that for that fuels, it's important to recognize if the fuels are not dead or not fully cured then you might be need to collect some samples. You might need to go there a few days later and, uh, or a day later and connect, collect samples of partially, partially um, dead light fuels. The reason being this, and the, and the, that finessing, during the finessing process that's happening when crops are drying, things change quite quickly, so really you want to know, you want to go there and sample these fuels right after. 
I also put a, um, a, note here, a notice here, be aware of portable fuel moisture measurement instruments. I try to, uh, some people like, really like those. And if you use those, uh, you need to make sure that's a proper calibration for the fuels that you are working on. So it goes back to that pre-fire work, do some, some destructive samples, and use this, um, this contraptions and see if the values are working well, because if you are 2% off, 1%, 2% off with this instrument in these wildfire conditions, that's a lot of error. And this is about that in terms of fuel moisture data collection. Um, again, if you need to sample fuels, uh, you need to go there and do it the next two, three days after the fire. You also need to acquire all the relevant uh, weather data within, within that period. Uh, it will be better if that data is available when the, from bomb weather stations um, and so on. So, but if you're just doing some of post-processing, you can do some weeks, namely look at the time series of fuel moisture and do those calculations, you can calculate much later. Take home messages, really what I want to do is get a map describing the fuel condition along the path of the fire to understand what's happening and how fire burn in those fuels. Uh, the detail is about getting that map, map, get that mosaic and quantify fuel structures for each fuel type that's in that map, um, and then, yeah, do that assessment yeah. of crop, fuel conditions, live fuel, if that's an issue, that's normally early in the season, uh, if that's an issue, get those values as well, um, yes, yeah. and that's all I have for this fuel distribution, fuel moisture, I'll go past that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll see. G'day, everyone. So this section on fire suppression has got three main subcomponents. Uh, we're looking at uh, suppression activities and effectiveness. So what information do we want and why? The data providers. Who are the main people that we want to get information from? And the required information. What is the information that we want from the data providers and what are the questions we should be asking? So much of this data will come from the questioning of data providers, so much of it's discussed in our later section uh, about um, interviewing. And we're interviewing people who will be providing information for other aspects of the data collection, so you've got to keep that in mind as well. So the, um, this is an overview of the, the information that we want. So we want to know what did the suppression resource, or what did the suppression response um, involved. So specifically the resource use, um, how that varied temporarily and spatially, and we also want to know a bit about the priorities for suppression and the tactics that we used. And we want to know this because we want to know how fire growth has been constrained by suppression, and we also want to know about the effectiveness of suppression actions used. Um, so we can get the first, the, um, the how fire growth has been constrained by sort of comparing with a uh, fire progression map and plotting where the resources were working at different times um, and, and doing that sort of a, a quick analysis. And there's an example here that um, comes from a paper that's over 50 years old now. Um, and, you know, if we could do it something like that back then on a grass fire, I'm sure we could do a lot better now with the technology and that that Miguel's been discussing before this. Okay, so the, now we'll talk about the um, suppression data providers, and I, I've sort of categorised them into three main groups. Um, the first group is the um, incident fire, uh, the fire ground incident controller. So these are the guys on the, the ground that are calling the shots. So generally a group captain or someone of, of that sort of regard, but initially it's, it's often someone that's a um, a crew leader on the first truck arriving. So 
got to keep in mind that the the person that's um, running the show may change over the course of the event, even in a sort of a quick incident like a, a crop or a grass fire. And these people are going to be giving us information on the suppression priorities over time uh, and, and some of the rationale behind that, uh, the selection and the execution of the tactics that they used, how effective they thought those tactics worked and how they might have changed over the course of the fire. Now the next group of people that we'll be talking to are the ground suppression operators. So it's fairly obvious these are, these are the majority of the people that will be working on the fire and they'll include the crew leaders and the crews that are operating tankers and other suppression resources. So they, these are the guys doing the hard work. And they're going to give us information on the difficulty of the, the suppression um, the effect and the and the effectiveness of the suppression. Um, they're going to potentially give us um, be able to potentially provide comparisons with other incidents. Incidents, so perhaps be able to say, oh, this this fire in a wheat paddock was easier or harder to put out than a similar fire that they might have had last week in a in a grassland field or something like that. Um, they're also able to identify specific influential factors that might have influenced the um, the suppression of the of the um, fire, so it might be things like the availability of water to, to refill tankers, or it might have been access through lots of fences, or, or or you know maybe the gate wasn't wide enough for the truck, that sort of thing. Those all those, all those little things can have a big effect on on um, suppression, and um, it's important to sort of get get a picture of those yeah, if you're thinking about the um, the effectiveness of suppression. And also we want to get a little bit about the details, well, we're going to get a lot about the details of where they worked and who they worked with and the tactics and techniques used. So I think Miguel mentioned a little bit earlier about some tracking systems and some, some trucks are starting to get some tracking systems in them, but um, I don't think they're that widely spread yet. But once they are, um, that, that sort of um, data might also be accessible to, to chase up and, and get some information. And the third group is the um, the people in the air. So the aer aerial suppression coordinators, and here we're mainly talking about the air attack supervisors and the air observers. And that's, as Miguel mentioned before, they're the people with the, um, the best view of the fire and, and um, able to capture the best imagery for us. And they can also give us some good information on the difficulty and effectiveness of, of their operations, um, particularly use of aircraft on, on um, fire and they'll be able to identify some influential factors that might have influenced their operations such as turbulence or maybe the location of the fire was too far away from water points or airports to, um, to enable quick turnaround times and that sort of thing. Um, they'll also be able to provide us details about where they worked and who they worked with, so what parts of the fire they worked on and why they worked there, um, were they working with units on the ground and were they suppressing the fire directly uh, using a suppressant or were they using a, a uh, retardant and whether was that being used indirectly or not. Okay, so now I'll just cover the information required. So these are the, the topics of the, or the, the general um, questions that we'll be asking when we're uh, following up these people. So the first topic was looking at the uh, size up of the fire and the priorities and objectives that are set early on. Um, so we want to ask um, firefighters when they get to the fire, what are the characteristics of the fire and, um, and what did the fire look like when they first arrived? And then we want to get a little bit of it, how that affected their uh, their size up and their, their uh, prioritisation um, and for setting objectives for the for the suppression. So if they thought the fire was heading towards the house, they might have moved straight into a property protection sort of role rather than just trying to contain the fire. So th those sort of things are important to um, to get a grasp of, to be able to uh, understand how um, and, and the rationale behind the, the suppression um, response and the, um, the tactics that they're, they're implementing. And that brings us to the next topic of tactics and techniques. And so there's a few different questions that we will want to ask here. Um, with the incident controller, we want to ask um, things about the, the reasons they selected the tactics and what the limitations might have been. So there's a lot of reasons that they might choose 
to use tactics or not. And they might include things like the resources that are available to them at the time. Um, you know, they, they might have insufficient resources to, to, um, to do certain tasks. So they might opt for a, an alternative measure and um, they might also be working with the terrain. So if they think the fire is heading towards a, a um, good ploughed paddock without any fuel in it, they might leave the head fire and, and, or sections that are going to impact that and just work on the sections of the fire that might be burning something a little bit more valuable. So it's good to get an idea of um, um, what, what the tactics were and the reasons and also the things that might have limited the effectiveness of those tactics, um, such as the you know, accessibility and those sorts of things. Uh, with the ground suppression, we want to ask them about what roles they were doing. Were they, were they in the tanker that was knocking down flames first up or were they doing a bit of a mop up behind the first tanker? Um, what were the other units they were working with and what, um, what parts of the fire were they working on? And, and the techniques they were using. So uh, we can ask them where and um, how they were working on the fire and we could probably get a little bit of information from things like this um, this picture here with, that shows all the, the track marks on the, um, on the edge of the fire and you can see where tankers have worked and you might be able to get a little bit of information there if it's happening during the fire. Uh, tracking information would be a lot better than that. Um, and with the techniques, we want to ask things like what techniques they were using in terms of were they knocking down the, were they using hoses from say the crew bay or were they using hoses free or um, or a um, monitor mounted to the, the um, bull bar or that sort of thing. And again with the aerial suppression we want to know where they were working, how they were integrated with the ground, are they knocking down flames and then the ground guys coming in to mop that up behind them. Um, and what sorts of drops they're using, so what, um, how the uh, pilots are being directed to, um, to apply their drops, uh, what sort of coverage levels and that sort of thing. Okay, now the last topics here on the uh, information required are the, uh, the effectiveness and difficulty of suppression. We want to know things about um, how um, how um, the incident went, did it go as planned, um, and this will be largely subjective information that we'll be getting. Um, we want to know about the effect on fire behaviour, this might be something we can get a little bit of information from but, um, by um, looking at photographs and working out what the, you know, getting a good estimate and comparing to our fire progression map so we'll be able to look and get a little bit of information about what the fire was like before the suppression and then and then whether the suppression was able to hold the fire, which um, you know, in some, some instances like a stubble crop we'd expect it to be pretty effective um, without too much trouble. Um, and we want to get a bit of a, an idea so we can compare that with other fires and get some idea uh, from the, the firefighters themselves what they think, it, um, how, how much easier or harder this fire was to suppress than, than some other fires in other fuel types. Um, and some other things about the limitations that, that might have affected the operation. So again, those things that might have slowed access or um, made it a little bit more difficult. You know, they wanna, if you want to find out that a tanker's pump broke or something like that, that might have had a big effect on, on how effective they were. Um, all those things are, are, are going to have an impact and they might lead to things such as changes in tactics. There might also be changes in tactics if you know the, the fire changes direction and starts to uh, threaten an asset or something like that as well. So take home messages for, for this component of the, um, of the talk here today. We're the uh, three main data providers for the suppression information are the, the fire ground incident controllers who are going to provide us information on suppression priorities, tactics selection, effectiveness and, and changes that might have happened over time. The ground suppression operators who can give us information on suppression difficulty and the, and the effectiveness of their suppression actions. Um, the specific details of their actions are also very important. And the uh, aerial suppression coordinators are able to give us some information on the difficulty and effectiveness from their operation and some specific details of, of how they conducted their operation. And finally, um, 
the discussion topics that we want to talk to these um, data providers about are in the topics of um, response timing, prioritisation and objectives, tactics and techniques, and the uh, limitations and effectiveness. And so all these things are mostly going to come from our um, interviewing of the um, interviewing of, of, of these people. And so um, they'll be incorporated in the interviews where we'll be asking a lot more information about other aspects such as the uh, fire behaviour and locations of fire over time. And so we'll move on to the next topic now of um, fire propagation and behaviour. Thanks, Matt. Me again, Andrew. Um, so this section follows is part two of one that Miguel um, presented earlier, fire propagation and behaviour, and it's probably a bit more general than that. Um, basically, after the fire is over, is extinguished and all put out, uh, the clock starts ticking. Um, so you need to be able to access the outstanding data that, that Miguel had mentioned earlier if you haven't had a chance to get it while the fire was actually burning. So this is a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, identifying and obtaining the outstanding data sets um, that were previously listed. Um, organising interviews and collecting additional data in the field as required. Um, the fuel moisture modelling, which I think we took out. Um, and then a bit more of a general discussion about assessing the reliability of the data. So, as I said, the clock starts ticking when the fire's out. Um, people start moving on to other things, um, either going back to their day job or on to the next fire. Um, if you've got a task to reconstruct this fire, you need to be able to get the data sets that you haven't previously um, obtained. So they may be available now, or um, you may have time to actually go and get them. Um, but if it hasn't been collected, it needs to be collected now before it disappears. Um, the things that could be collected now include such things as the uh, burned area or fire footprint, um, which can either be done doing precision mapping on the ground or even you know, uh, modern approaches uh, like using um, drones with GPS to, to fly the boundary of the fire. Uh, quite often high resolution aerial photography is used to document the burned area. Um, if that's not flown um, relatively soon after the fire, it, its value starts to diminish. Um, if there isn't a formal flight organised, then there is a possibility you could do the same sort of thing with the drone. Um, accessing the weather data from AWS's from the fire area and surrounds and for the preceding days um, can also be uh, quite useful. And also accessing other um, GIS type layers um, uh, are also uh, necessary at this point. So the addition of data collection, Miguel went through quite a bit of that in terms of uh, immediate post-fire fuel status, so in terms of fuel types um, and validation of what information you do have on fuel types. So you may have maps or something from you know, the Department of Prime Industries or whatever. You need to ensure that that is accurate. So either going into the field and, and, and uh, validating it or, or uh, talking to people and, and, and finding out what was there before it was burnt. Also uh, getting detailed information on what the condition of the fuel was before it was burnt, um, whether it was standing crop, harvested crop or, or desiccated. Getting some sort of handle on what the harvest schedule was to find out what was harvested when. Um, also trying to find aerial photography before the fire might be handy as well for determining what fuel types were there. Um, and similarly with curing state. Um, and at the, driving all this is, is trying to validate what information you have collected. And then as Miguel also said, the, the objective is to try to create a, a map of the fuels uh, involved. 
Um, in terms of fire behavior, there's, there's quite a few different sources of possible fire, fire propagation data that you can access. Um, infrared line scan imagery from the state aircraft unit. Um, oblique aerial photos, whether from the aerial firefighting um, people or from others. Uh, there may be drones flying around, who knows. Um, firefighter observations, as, as Matt mentioned. Um, your own observations, if you're in the field, getting direct observations of fire behaviour, um, particularly spotting. And of course, um, the weather. Now, Matt will talk later on about the process of actually doing interviews, but this is after the fire. This is one of the primary sources of um, information about what the fire did. So the first step uh, is organising and obtaining approvals to conduct interviews, both with firefighting um, staff as well as landowners affected by the fire and also general public who may not be directly involved but may have seen something. Um, and of course the, the objective is to try to establish um, the progression of the fire, the occurrence of spot fires and, and their influence, if any, um, and time of arrival of the fire at, at valid points. Obtaining the radio logs and or incident reports from um, those suppressing the fire will be very valuable. Also obtaining photographic and video evidence of fire is extremely useful. Um, you must ensure that the timing of the device used to um, take the video has been checked. Most things like mobile phones will be quite reliable, but if somebody is using a, a, um, a camera, uh, you need to make sure that the time of that camera has been checked. Uh, quite often you'll find that, that um, people's cameras um, going into the fire season haven't been changed for daylight savings, so you need to do that. Um, and then as, as Matt just talked about, uh, establishing the suppression actions and effects all need to be done very soon after the fire is finished. Uh, and then we move into, once you've got all that data, establishing the levels of reliability. Now I talked about that briefly with weather, but I'll go into a little bit more detail here. Um, so we know that when you're trying to reconstruct a wildfire, there's a very high degree of uncertainty in all of the data that you're collecting. Um, the more information you have about the conditions and spread of the fire, the better, but not all data sources are created equal. Um, and they will have a broad range of reliability. And it's your task as the reconstructor to make a, a you know, essentially a subjective assessment of what that level of reliability is. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, the reliability index goes from one that is most reliable to five, which is, well, I've said least reliable, but it's, it's not necessarily unreliable, but it just has a lower level of reliability. We have here a, a summary table for our descriptions of the, the reliability levels for weather, fuel moisture, fuel complex information as well as rate of spread. Um, so I took, went through the weather one previously. I won't go through all these at the moment, but basically you're wanting to identify those sources of data that you can have some confidence in are using and assessing the relative importance of different data sources. So if you get two conflicting pieces of evidence, um, you, you then assess which piece of evidence you use based on the level of reliability. So the most reliable piece of evidence will have a greater weighting than than the conflicting piece of evidence that has a lower level of reliability. So you need to be able to do that um, basically for all the sources of data that you that you use. What we talked about, uh, or Matt and I talked about earlier today, is actually having something similar for suppression. Um, 
and it might be worthwhile having a bit of a think about what the, the level reliability ratings would be for suppression data. Um, so once you've done that, um, basically you're, you're moving into the phase of actually analysing the data. Um, so the take home messages from this section is, uh, as I said, once the fire has been extinguished, the, the clock is ticking. You've got uh, very limited time to go and collect any outstanding data that hasn't already been collected, particularly for stuff that's on the ground. Um, data that was perhaps not previously available during the fire when you went looking for it may be ready now. Um, and you need to undertake some level of validation of the data that, that you've collected. Um, either through field visits or, or talking to people. Um, and then you can start building the data layers that you need to um, start analysing for constructing the, uh, the, the reconstruction. Um, yeah, and that's it, that one. So yeah, the video information and photographs that people have allow you to gather additional information on, on the behaviour of the fires, spot fires and other things. Um, and also allows you to target particular landowners, particularly if they've uploaded stuff onto social media, you can you can find out who they are and, and actually get more detailed um, information from them through direct questioning. Um, and as I said, the, the, the last step before you move into analysing the data is, is establishing the levels of reliability for the data that you've collected that's been verified uh, against independent sources. And I'll hand over to Miguel for section eight. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, we're almost there. Uh, All right, so section eight is really about, it's a very small one, uh, talking about data layers, mapping and GIS. Uh, a lot of people out there that probably know a lot of more of these than we do, but we just want to give a few, point a few important points. Um, one of it, there's a lot of data out there, uh, a lot of, uh, geospatial databases and things like that, that um, you'll be able to, to rely on or you'll need to rely on to, um, to conduct this, this case study, talking about uh, base spatial layers like roads, infrastructure and towns. Uh, there's vegetation fuel layers, could be the state level fuel types and times since fire. Um, the National Vegetation Information System. Uh, crop types and conditions, that will be things that the, the farmer might have as a, as a, as a layer as well. Uh, and even other information like satellites and um, some of the more experimental um, products out there might be able to be used uh, to get some um, quite detailed uh, idea of what's in paddocks. Uh, a lot of times, some of this work we're talking here, mainly talking with the farmer, uh, talk about small fires, right? But if you have a, a fire that makes it run over 20, 20 kilometers, you're not going to be able to talk with the farmer, right? So you need to rely on other other um, sources. And so some of these um, uh, fine scale uh, satellite products that are out there might be of um, of usage for your case study. Show you guys that the, that the agencies sometimes come across a lot of these new products. Um, again, also existing layers, digital elevation models, something to to use in some in some situations. A lot of crop level crop crop lands are quite flat, but there'll be some information, uh, some things that need to be derived from that. Um, from the DEMs, uh, also good to, to know where are areas that uh, within a fire that uh, might have slowed the fire down. Uh, you know, talking about creek lines and things like that that are noticeable in the in the DEM. Um, yeah, more, 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 with more information, 
and then curing level in greenness, because some of those other greenness products that are out there. Um, I'm not sure if those, some like curing levels vary from state to state. I'm not sure if there's a, right now, uh, there was a push, another push for uh, a national standard for curing mapping. Um, not sure where are we in that space, um, but yeah, different agencies have different products a lot of times. Um, weather, uh, yeah, and you mentioned about that, uh, about the greedy weather that's available. That you know you can put it back to in into your um, your just special space and even do some more analysis, namely some more finer scale wind modeling and also some fuel moisture wind model, as an example here on on the bottom. Uh, Right, this was a uh, for Black Saturday some work that Andrew and Stuart Matthews conducted, where throughout the day uh, and at, at the scale of the fire, the Gilmore fire, they, they they were able to model um, death fuel moistures throughout the, the diurnal cycle at a large landscape. So that's again something you can get. Um, with uh, GIS space, really, uh, here just summarizing, uh, you, at some point you really need to bring down all that data, all those interviews, observations uh, into a, a GIS space, uh, or just drawing a map if you're like me. Um, but important thing, a really important thing, critical thing is get Align the coordinate and projection data. Depends on what how data was captured, uh, what's being used. There's some variation in things. It can be put you off by hundreds of meters. So that's important to look into this aspect. It might be uh, bread and butter for for some of you, but for others, it, it, it might be uh, not not as evident. Sometimes you, you you try to or you tend to just take what is given to us as as, as accurate, but sometimes there's a, a fi, uh, fine detail um, that leads us into some uncertainty. And another one of those is these directional observations, recording in the field and for fire propagation and wind speeds and things like that. They are often aligned to the magnetic north, and you need really to correct those um, to have the true north when you put all that directional data uh, together. Take home messages for this very uh, short section. There is a wealth of geospatial and temporal, temporal information out there. Uh, and sometimes you don't even believe they are there. Uh, and it's all you want to really start to talk doing case studies with people that know about this, uh, that you come across some satellite information, database, databases that are available, they really complement your case study. Um, but again, these, these things need to be found. It's a lot about the experience. Um, be pragmatic, uh, we'll bring that later. Uh, again, be focused on what matters and do not get lost in the details. Uh, again, we, are all, we all have different jobs that you do, you do on our day to day. And this comes a bit of a, uh, out of nowhere, right? And uh, this need for the case study need to be opportunistic, but be pragmatic, focus on what matters. Don't solve these databases, and they are totally uh, they are valuable, but they might lead you astray, right? So focus is, is the key. Here, reference all observations. And remember to align coordinate to projection data. And now, I pass you to Matt Lusinski. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we're on the home stretch now, so thanks for hanging in. Um, here we are talking about um, interviewing, and we've broken this into um, two main groups that are. Um, interviewing the, those people that are involved in suppressing the fire, so the firefighters and other observers, so general public. 
Uh, when we're interviewing firefighters, um, as discussed before, we um, these these guys can be the the a really good source of um, of a lot of the information. You now they speak the same language as us and um, understand a lot more about fire propagation and behaviour than than the general public do. So you can probably use a little bit more terminology with them as well. You know, one problem with firefighters is that they tend to be very busy when they're at fires and um, they might be too busy putting the fire out to um, to be looking at things that we might be interested in um, from for our observations. Uh, and another really important um, thing to, to mention here early on is that interviewing any observers of the fires, it's, it's really important to do that as soon as possible after the fire. Um, you know, the, lo the longer time passes, um, the more people forget, and the, the particularly the more more of the fine details that we might want information on um, gets lost uh, or confused. And so uh, it's really critical to get in there as soon as as soon as possible after the fire. Um, and interviewing firefighters and lane managers can be tricky. Um, you know, they they're, they're busy people. They can be hard to track down at times. Um, firefighters. You don't want to make them feel like they're being investigated. Um, uh, you know, some people jump to, to immediate sort of um, negative feelings about um, things that might have gone wrong or could have gone better. And you, it's very important to be clear that um, this isn't a witch hunt or a, or a, an inquisition as such. It's we're here just to get information about the fire, and that's our our main point of interest. So it, you know, it's important to reassure them. That that's what the investigation's about, and um, and we want to know about the factors that are affecting it, and um, and what actually happened, um, mainly from the fire's point of view. And if you're going to take any recordings, which is quite a useful thing to do, um, you could ask permission to to do that, and make sure you're polite when you're talking to them. Okay, there are three main aspects. Um, or three main perspectives, and I, I talked about this earlier on about the people, that, the groups of people we want to talk about, um, we want to get information from. So the incident controller on the ground, um, ground um, we want the uh, the people operating the ground suppression equipment, and um, and the um, and we also want to get some some information from the, the people in the in the air. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about before is some of the background information that we want to get, and it's important that when we're documenting the interviews that we get information, just general background information about the names of the people, what units they were working in, and if that's a normal role, and what sort of experience they might have working in that role and on those uh, fires in that particular fuel types, and, and also um, get some, some contact details and, and leave your contact details if anything further comes along. Okay, during during the interview, um, you want to have a sort of an introductory phase where you talk about uh, where, you know, when that, how they got to the fire, what, um, what they first saw, and what their first perceptions were, and uh, get get some. It's useful if you're um, working in person with them, to, or um, or over uh, a phone that you can be looking at the same map to um, to get some some idea about where they were working and 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 some get some certainty about that. Um, you want to know where they first saw the fire, and you want to get some ideas about what what they did during the fire and what they might have seen, and particularly where where the fire might when the fire might have arrived at certain landmarks such as roads or um, fence lines. Um, we want to know what direction the fire was spreading, um, what sort of vegetation it was burning in, and some some other behaviour um, as to like, particularly spotting when it's breaching roads and other fuel breaks, get an idea of how far it is, how far that might have been, um, where the sources were. Generally, it might be a bunch of trees by the side of the road. Also, want to know about um, how tall the flames were, and other um, and other um, fire, um, fire behaviour features. Uh, and you know, one of one of the gold things to, for working um, working. Uh, Developing a reconstruction is photographs, um, as has been discussed before. But, um, Dean's raised the point here about uh, dash cam footage, and that's that's really good if it's available. I know some tankers do have it, 
um, and some vehicles of private citizens that might see the fire might also have it. So um, anything like that that you can track down is, is really valuable. And um, yeah, any other photos that people take, um, particularly photos that get posted to social media, are, uh, are really um, useful too. Um, now we'll talk about interviewing the members of the general public. Um, they can provide valuable information as well, because particularly if they've seen seeing um, the fire from a different perspective and they they um, might have some local knowledge because they particularly if they, if they live in the neighbourhood. Um, I guess uh, you, you might be interviewing people in groups or um, or individually and uh, it's important to understand when you're um, interviewing people in groups that you, you don't just let uh, a, a single person who might be a, a sort of dominant personality influence how others are talking and it's, it's so often good to um, pull the quiet people aside and, and, and get their perspective as well because um, they might have even been in a better position but they just might be a uh, more introverted person so uh, less willing to sort of share that in a, in a group situation. Um, you're going to have to be prepared to deal with people that are, have seen something that, that might have affected them negatively and might have left them in a state where they're experiencing grief or anger or might be frustrated or um, or that so um, you might be in, in the firing line for some of those emotions and I, I guess you're just going to have to put up with that and, and deal with it as it comes. Um, it's important not to underestimate the, uh, the knowledge that the general public might have. Um, they might have more experience in the fire uh, with fire than you and they might and they certainly will probably have uh, more experience in that location than you and so might be more familiar with the uh, the local area. Um, and again, if you're going to record the um, interviews, ask for permission first, give them your business card and contact details so they know you are. Uh, be polite. That might mean you have to put up with bad coffee and, and eat the cake that uh, might be stale or whatever, but um, just, just appreciate it and you might have a standard list of questions to, um, to follow through. Um, and those questions for the members of the public include these things about, um, again, follows the same path as, as what the question is um, that we would have asked firefighters. It's probably just a, a different level of detail um, about what, what they saw, particularly from, from first encountering the fire to, to, to later on, anything they might have in terms of, um, in terms of um, fires reaching landmarks and, um, and, and that sort of thing. They, they might be as aware of some of the, the um, fire behaviour as, as firefighters, um, but you know, if they've got pictures and that sort of thing, it's really worth chasing those up. Um, and particularly, uh, these, these groups might be, you know, it's, it's often good to do a social media search after a fire and um, look up the location and see if, see if anyone's posted anything. You might want to chase down pages for local community groups and, and local brigades. Um, but, you know, the, the key take, take home messages here and one, one that's missing is, is you've really got to do this as soon as possible after the fire. Um, there's a wealth of information out there that can be collected from people um, and you know, you've got to balance that uh, effort that's required to get that information with the value of the case study and as it's important to be patient and polite with them and, and, and look up those social media posts which is something we should have put there. Um, uh, Neil's asked if um, these slides can be made available for the download. Um, they have been distributed to the mail list but um, our um, email addresses are there and you just flick us one, one of us an email and we can, we can send them to you individually too if you'd like. Uh, I'll pass you back to Miguel now. And yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks Matt. Yeah. You just, um, yeah, just finishing. Uh, not sure if everybody's still there. They probably have went to have lunch. Come back. We're still here. Uh, next, um, bring, it all, bring it all together. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, bring it all together, really. Um, Final session, just a few slides. All right, now it's about, you got all that information. Um, it's about putting it all together. Uh, talk about trying to determine location of the active fire perimeter at different times with the fire. That's the essence 
of the case study. Um, so we'll fire behavior component uh, is between addition and containment, add those reliability scores so that are not forgetting with time. Um, identify the most reliable fire spread information. And the very important aspect here is it's about quality, it's not quantity. Um, you know about, about ten, uh, having 10 data points or 10 spread, spread runs. Uh, if they are not very certain, it maybe it's better just to have two or three, but they are really good and you are really have confidence on the, on the data that's in there. And from that, then, we're going to develop this isochrone map. Uh, bring the other fire environment information. Uh, start calculating some of these things. That, so uh, from our point of view, uh, we do these case studies to learn about fire behavior. One is that analysis of the phenomena happened, but also we want to then try to apply our models. Uh, that we use in our F-band day-to-day operations, and um, we're going to compare what the models tell with what was observed, right? And that's the uh, that's what that's where we start learning things and start to question what we have been doing and improve ourselves, right? Uh, and after you get all that, uh, you get the weather, you get the fire propagation, um, you get the fuels, and then you need to write a narrative really, uh, uh, how things evolved through time. Um, in terms of report preparation, so after compiling all this information, yeah, we want to write it down. Uh, we want to disseminate it. And um, as I said here, the challenge is to distill the mass of information into a coherent summary. It's, it's very easy when you put a lot of effort into something, that is very easy to get lost on that and, and just spend too much time addressing things or describing things that their value is tangential, tangential to these uh, case studies. So again, gotta gotta focus, and that's the challenge: is to to keep focus and work on really what matters. Um, measure size does not matter. Uh, again, go be pragmatic. And as an example, a case study could be one two pager. Here's a good example here. Uh, there's the location, time of the day, that's the fuels, um, the topography, the weather, the very small one, um, small burning period, and then you have some simulations, fire behavior simulations observed and predicted, and a map. This could be a case study. This is by itself has a lot of value, right? Uh, or you, know, you could do a multi-chapter uh, report with uh, some, case, some case studies that have hundreds of pages, right? They normally are about fires that, not just a fire, it, it, it is a, uh, I'm a, like when you talk about Black Saturday, you, just not, you cannot do that, do justice to that event with a case study of one page. No, you need, you, there's a lot of, lot of perspectives, there's a fire behavior, there's other things. So when you bring that together, you have a, a, quite a piece of work. So we really need to balance it. Uh, as a suggested outline for a report, we have here an introduction, chronology and development. Uh, in terms of fire propagation, just focusing on the fire. Um, and also you can mix that a bit of fire suppression. Then the tales of fire environment, the fire environment, fuels, weather. Uh, and then that's where we go and analyze, we combine the fire development with the, with the fire development with the fire environment, uh, analyze the fire behavior, do some simulations maybe, and then come to a conclusion but the conclusion, you might add uh, an appendix or two with data, and important thing is where you're going to put this so that other people are going to be aware of it. And in 10, 15 years, this has not been forgotten, but it's available for the learners of uh, a fire, students of fire. 
here's a, a bit of a, a, a detailed view of, the, of some of that uh, that I just mentioned in terms of the outline for preparing a, a wildfire case study. This was put by by Marty Alexander and Dave Thomas uh, 10, uh, well, 15 years ago. Uh, in fact, let me tell you that uh, this fire management note, like fire management today, if you search it, there's two issues that are a compilation. You can find them online. There's a part one here and the part two. That is a compilation of wildfire case studies developed um, mostly in Canada and the U.S over a period of more than 50 years. And so they republished them. And so it can be very, very instructive just to look and, and see how those things have, have been done in the past and how people describe the fires. So anyways, um, yeah, we have here some more detail if you want to go in through, through that. All these bits of the outline. And just some concluding remarks on this case study uh, approach. Uh, this is not just used for wildfires, but um, there's definitely a, an application of wildfires. So seek to learn more about the case study method, what other people have done in the past, even other applications. Make it a personal goal to try and complete at least one wildfire case study every year. If we had something like that going on at uh, different agencies, different states, wow, you can just imagine the wealth of information on fire behavior and understanding of the fire behavior that we would, we would have right now. And you would be, we will be surprised by the wealth of new knowledge you'll acquire while carrying out a case study, right? Uh, again, we, we know with a, with a professional commitment we have. It's very rare to get in the field. Each time we get in the field, you learn new things. And with this case study, yeah, even even more in terms of fire behavior. Um, understanding of wild and fire behavior is key to safe and effectiveness control or use of planned of, or, or planned or accidental fires. It's like the, the corollary of all this, and that's why we do all this work we do. <laughs> so, I've well, been here for a while. Anyways, uh, follow up. Uh, some emails, uh, some questions. I haven't been reading them. So we've got we've got one question from Mike regarding ethics approval for the project. Um, the short answer is that this project, which is the generation of the fire reconstruction guide, doesn't have ethics approval because we weren't interviewing people, but the application of the reconstruction guide um, will probably rely upon each agency's processes for actually conducting interviews, um, and I don't know what they are. Good question. Yeah, so I would just suggest also uh, this, this, this ethics approval really escalates when there's Facilities and things like that. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you just go out and talk with a farmer, uh, have a casual conversation of what happened, uh, it might not be as um, required, it might not be as high, but that's a very good point that we'll probably need to follow up uh, and see where we are, we are in that space. Yeah, I think there, there's some sort of um, details involved as to what the purpose of the interviewing is, whether the um, Purpose is to um, use the the interview responses as part of research, um, whereas the, in this case uh, the, the reconstruction um, isn't predicated solely upon the interview responses. They're just used to augment um, the results. I think. But uh, I'll leave that to agency people to actually answer more fully. We might also have, there might be questions that people want to do it verbally without... The conference is now in conversation mode. All participants are now unmuted. That's it. 
Any other questions? Okay, the line should be open now, Miguel, so anyone should be able to ask a question if they wish. Okay, back to you, Mike, I think. Okay, if there's no questions, there's a lot covered there. Um, Miguel, I, I assume the intent is for other for other people to try and attempt to reconstructions. That's correct, and uh, so this is the bushfire CRC project um, through CFA. We provided uh, so CFA as that uh, the guide field guide and the, the field sheets in a draft form and uh, because it's an interagency and every agency has its own already forms namely to uh, monitor fire behavior and weather so um, I'm not sure how this fits with the other agencies I'm not, also not sure how much people of the other agencies are aware of um, the contents of this guide, because this went out some time ago, but I'm not sure what how each agency um, uh, spread that kind of information. Uh, so we haven't had much feedback yet. Uh, fire season is going to start. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. If Rachel has uh, anything to add on, on that? Uh, thanks, Miguel. I was just going to say, um, I guess we're all trying to be on the same page when it comes to um, learning and doing these reconstructions. So I guess um, lacking any sort of field um, component to this, it would be good if there was a, a crop land wildfire that we might actually work together a bit on learning. So um, I know in Victoria we've got a spike day coming up this Friday. Um, we're probably going to be on the ready in case um, we're going to go out and um, try and you know, opportunistically capture something if something might occur, but I guess it'd be good if every other jurisdiction was sort of thinking the same thing and if something does happen and you might be going out in a field that let us know and we might be able to come and help and, you know, work together and collaborate a bit on this uh, learnings. And if we do do a um, reconstruction, do you want us to just send it to you or what's the method of publishing it out for, you know, Prosperity or whatever. Oh, that's, that's a very good point. I'm not sure if that question was for us or for Rachel. Yeah, but, sorry, um, that's you. Oh, sounds good. Uh, thanks. Yeah, um, we in this project we are committed. I think we are committed to do a few. Uh, we'd like to do a few case studies, uh, help people. So we will not be doing the case studies themselves, but help people analyze them right away um, and so um, if you yeah if you do keep us in touch uh, email us uh, and we'll go from there uh, and then there's also the talk about doing a workshop later in the year where we all come together and we look at, the, uh, at these things and what we learned uh, and what needs to be done to improve the, the methods uh, but yeah, yeah. Please, please feel free to get in touch with us um, with stuff that you collect, and we'll, we'll, yeah. Of course, there's there's 20 case studies. You might you might be well overwhelmed, uh, but now we will we'll try to figure out something that will work with everybody. Sounds good. I was just thinking, even if um, you know, we write up a report ourselves, it's no good sitting on a shelf in our agency here. So we'll have to. You know, if you're going to collate a whole bunch together, are you going to put that together or we just put it out there somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm hoping that's where Sorrow might be able to help have a look over, you know, if we have multiple case studies, they can start pulling out their uh, key similarities and differences to start teasing apart some of those differences in, yeah, crop fire propagation. 
Yeah, sounds sounds a, a really good idea, and that um, yeah, we can then uh, in the end of the year, uh, I don't know, in the season as we do this workshop, as we collate those things, come out with a with a solution in terms of collating them and making them available. Um, definitely a, a great idea. We don't want to lose that uh, data. There's also um, here a question from John. Is there an intent to generate a consistent set of questions that we could all use? Um, there's a few in that uh, those field sheets that we sent this morning. You probably nobody has time to look into those. Um, there's a few set of questions already there. Um, I guess um, it's just like almost conversation starters, and then you really um, go from there. Uh, with more detail and as you try to understand things better uh, through the conversation, but there's already a set there. Yeah. Thanks, Miguel. I'll have a look. Um, Thanks, John. Hi, Good Miguel. Question. Sorry. Hello. Uh, Miguel. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yep. This is Agnes from WA. Um, we've actually collected some data from Dalwellinu. Um, they the crop they was it was hit by lightning on the 15th of November. So we've actually got six sites. Um, there are actually 54 in total that got hit. Um, I was under the impression that we filled up the questionnaires and then passed that on to you guys. So um, now I'm a little bit confused. You'd like us to write the report and then send it to you, or? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the thing is, if you send us some data, I guess we will not have. Uh, we don't have an understanding really of what's in there. Maybe we'll need to talk. Um, outside, uh, offline about this. Agnes, that's a, a good point. Because, um, yeah, if we need to write six reports, it might be quite um, intensive for us as well in terms of time. Have they all happened on the one day, Agnes? That's Andrew here. Yes, it is all in one day, Andrew. Hello. Oh, you could have, you could have one report. So that's one report? Yeah. Because um, we, we tried to collect uh, different crops as well. Yep. Again, it could be something that can be a very short, um, a very short, uh, but very valuable uh, report on on the fire behavior that happened. Yeah. Depends on what you have. But uh, yeah, let's talk about this offline and um, the, follow that up. Yeah. The the, the the objective of this project, Agnes, wasn't about collecting data, but uh, developing capability in terms of generating case studies um, in the agencies. Yep. So there may have been some confusion there as to as to what the actual intent was. So, um, so the work that we've done is actually tried to detail the methodology. Um, for collecting the data, but then also collating the data and, and generating a um, case study, um, but not, yeah, I mean, have, having six fire events, the, the, the intent wasn't to be able to, to do the same level of, of uh, reconstruction for each one. It was, it was more about sort of selecting priorities and what have you. Um, so, yeah, I think. We'll have a chat with you off offline and, and see what we can do to help. That sounds good because it, it is our first time as well, and we didn't think there will be any crops that's going to burn. But um, yeah, thanks to the lightning, we've got about 54, and then we thought we better try to collect as um, as many as we can before it's too late. But um, yeah, a, a, a further chat will be fantastic. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks, David. Brett Beecham here. Just a question about a repository. Could we use, or could the Amicus knowledge base be a suitable repository for these case studies? That would be perfect. I would, I would love that to happen, um, Brett. But uh, yeah, at this point in time, um, we haven't thought about it. Okay. I mean, Amicus a, a repository. Yeah, Amicus has not. 
Uh, as it stands, Amicus has a capability already? As, as it stands, that, that was, it's not possible, but that, that was the, the original vision of, Am of Amicus yeah. was to bring together that, that case study uh, information. Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, we, we hadn't thought about that next step as to what to do with all the case studies that get generated, and that's something that we'll have to talk to Rachel about as to, as to um, uh, creating a home for these things so that people can actually learn from them. Yep. Um, it's a brilliant idea. I like it. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks, Brad. Thanks very much, Brad. Um, and I guess just um, as well, it's worth mentioning that um, through the Victorian Government Safer Together program, we're actually going to be conducting some uh, crop experimental burns uh, this January. So if there are any FBNs who are interested from other jurisdictions who I haven't spoken to who are interested in participating, shoot me an email at r.bessel at cfa.vic.gov.au and I'm just putting together a bit of a list to, let, to notify people when we might be conducting those burns and you can... Um, yeah, see firsthand some um, experimental fires in crops. Yeah, and uh, on that note, I might add there will be a great opportunity to know more about crops as a fuel, because there'll be a lot of uh, fuel sampling. <laughs> okay, thanks for that as well, Andrew and Matt and Rachel. Uh, that was really comprehensive. You win the prize for the longest webinar we've had so far. Uh, I'll put your, put your chocolate bar in the things. mail. Um, if there's any other questions people think of later, um, uh, contact one of those people and they should be able to help you. And we hope to hear from the team down the track in terms of you know, who's doing what and maybe a bit of coordination for helping each other out. So thank you very much. I might just uh, add one little note. Uh, yeah, Mike and Greg, thanks very much to allow us to use the, your platform to do this uh, delivery of the course and on such a short notice. So I really appreciate that and, um, and looking forward to see this online. So, yeah, later. Thanks, Michael. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone, for uh, attending.